What's going on everybody? Today we're in Grand Rapids, Michigan at Van Nandel Arena. Today me and Mike, we're gonna go behind the scenes of the Grand Rapids Griffin. So today we have a special guest, Mike King. He's usually behind the camera filming all of our EGD Life episodes, but today Mike's now gonna join us on this side of the camera. He used to work here. We're gonna to tour the Grand Rapids Griffins organization. Mike, you used to work here, obviously. So tell us a little bit about what you used to do here and a little bit about what Grand Rapids means to you and the Griffins. Yeah, so I worked here, I think starting in 2015 until end of 2017. I was a video producer. Mm -hmm. So I did videos for, you know, the open videos in the arena, the mm -hmm. LED ribbon that goes around the arena that you'll see later. Awesome. Uh, for social online and corporate sponsor stuff. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible experience. In 2017, they won the Calder Cup. Which must have been amazing, lifting and, that cup and being a part of that oh, celebration. Oh, it was unbelievable. And the, the players that were on the team, they were all unbelievable guys. So who are we going to see first here? Yeah, so first off, we're going to meet Bob Kayser, the Vice President of Community Relations and their broadcaster. Kayser. Hey, my good buddy. <laughs> How you doing? Hey, good. good to see you. Rick, Rick, nice yeah, to meet you. Thank you so yeah, much. Great to see you, Rick. Tell me a little bit about your role in, in the Grand Rapids Griffins and what you've been doing here all these years. Yeah, it's kind of evolved a little bit since I came here in 2000. Um, initially hired to you know, oversee all the broadcast elements and, and do the play-by-play -play itself on radio. And one thing I've, I've really worked hard on in my years in this game is to understand the importance of being well-rounded. And you know, in the minor pro ranks, you're you're going to be doing you're going to be wearing several hats. And the more you wear, the, the more opportunity you're going to have in the future. And so I, I tried to learn everything there was to learn about this business when I first started. You know, PR, media relations, uh, selling, uh, community relations, marketing, you know, the hockey ops side of it. it you know, so I, I worked hard on, on all of that stuff. And so when I came here, my primary focus was the broadcast and then eventually to oversee all the community relations and then assist with pretty much the day-to-day -day business operations here. So we're closely with Tim Gortzema and uh, my fellow VP, Sean Wright and Matt Batchelder to, to help oversee the, the business side of it. Multiple hockey players have different paths of getting there. Some right. people have the fast track and are naturally born with that gift and some people take a little bit longer and there's nothing wrong with that and everybody has their own way of getting there and that's one thing I've always admired about the AHL is you are at one step away from the National Hockey League. It's not just the maturation on the ice, but it's also the, the maturing off the ice. It's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot to being a professional hockey player. Uh, you know, it's not just playing the game. It's, it's, it's how you handle the media. It's how you handle being out in the community, doing appearances. It's how you handle dealing with fans. And our players are routinely um, you know, applauded for their efforts in, in our community and, and, and not to mention the success on the ice. I think the stat <laughs> is 88% of players in the NHL came from the AHL. Um, and every team has their affiliate team. So can you kind of just give the basic scoop of what is the AHL, or, you know, arguably the second best league in the world, and players come here to get to the NHL. And most guys are on NHL contracts as well. Right, yeah, the, uh, and you hit it on the head too, Mike. It's, it's, I think this year it's 89. I know it touched 90% at one point this year. And they'll, they'll send that stat out about once a month. Um, you know, with the percentage of players in the National Hockey League that came from the AHL. And not all of them necessarily come from the AHL. Some have already maybe started in the NHL, but spent time in the Played. AHL, and you know how that works. But a vast majority of guys that get to the NHL start here. You know how popular the players are, right? Yeah. I don't think anybody is more popular, frankly, than the guy that sits in this, what is sit in this office? He's working in this office and all around the place. Our crew manager, Brad Dog Thompson. What's up, Bob? Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hey, guys, Hi. how you doing? Good. Well, I'm the guy. I've been here 22 years, um, 18 as the head guy. Um, I've seen a lot of these guys actually on the Alumni Wall of Fame, except for the first one I got a pleasure to work with. So. Uh, all those guys there that I've had the opportunity to take care of. Um, each guy has an individual stick pattern. Every you can see them here that everybody's laid out by number. Obviously, they get sticks, but what else do they get? And they go through youth for. Yeah, we have like pants, helmets, their skates. You know, it's it's probably a three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar budget yeah. that I handle with you know, players' needs through the year. Okay, and what about the goaltenders? And I'm a goalie coach, so yep. obviously uh, I'm interested in the goalie aspect of it. What are some things that the goalies ask for specifically? The goalies, the goalies now, um, I have a goalie actually that has like a 5,000 off cut on okay. the blade. So 
instead of having flat blades, mm -hmm. he's now on an angle, so he's only okay. on one blade, his inside blades. Oh, no way. So that's a, that's a new thing for me. And um, guys usually go through, you know, four or five sets of blockers and catchers a year oh. now, so that's they burn through them, and it gets expensive. So. Yeah. Here we are in the little path of the van handle underneath <laughs> the stairs where... You know, like here's each individual guy sticks in at $259 a piece if you were to buy it for the yeah. family. It gets a little expensive, as you can see. Right. But we have, you know, our drinks, our stuff we take on the road over here. Um, I have a profiler, a keg machine profiler. that profiles the skates of mm -hmm. the player if they want to lean back, forward, whatever. Um, laundry, helmets. Like in here, there's, you know, toiletries. You know, like we have toiletries and whatever the guys need you know behind the scenes stuff you'd never think but they're taking well care of i'm the team mom or the team dad you need a hug i'll give you a hug and if you need a belt i'm not afraid to let you know that you're being an idiot so i mean it's a two-way street you know it's, it's you know different personalities all the time you read everybody and mm -hmm. sometimes you gotta pull their chain sometimes you gotta hug them so right. they respond and they do their job and we've won two cups in the last what four years five years so Exciting. Our guys are our guys are really good. Four sticks for one practice. Not four, but captain. Part of my role is obviously all the behind the scenes stuff a lot of people don't think about. Uh, for example, Wilkesbury came in from Milwaukee today at about 4 a.m. So uh, woke up at about 3 o'clock, got to the rink, and uh, made sure that they were good to go and helped them load their gear in and then uh, you know, make sure everything's good for practice. Uh, obviously, sewing socks earlier. And, a lot of stuff that uh, you know, people don't really think about, that's kind of what I'm doing here. Okay, now listen. You told, this, me, you told me before our game, take new stick before every game. So this stick here scored you two goals in two minutes, and you're not going to use it again? Yeah, but I did get a third, one of the hat trick. Oh, one of the hat trick, not so good you, enough. So you, so you put it in a cage. So, so, yeah, so that, and then a game winner doesn't work no, for anything? No, he's wanted to pop his gloves and stick oh, in a big case. Oh, yeah, a big case. To carry home. Carry home to check, eh? Yeah, carry home. Like, this is the only thing I see wrong with this stick right here. See? Oh, that's no good? Broke. Explain to us what we have here, what you do as uh, an athletic trainer. Okay, as an athletic trainer, we have two of us here. So we have myself, and then this year we had an assistant, which is Anthony Palazzo. Uh, he's through Metro Health, which is where some of our doctors are from. Our doctors are basically provided by Metro Health and by Orthopedic Associates of Michigan. We have the training tables over here. We yeah. have some recovery stuff for the guys. They use There's boots and hips and things like that that guys will use after practice for recovery. Before practice, obviously, the hot tub's a very popular place for our guys yeah. um, before they go in the gym and start doing their actual warm up and all that. After practice, a lot of guys will use the cold tub. Cold tub, we try and keep it around 50 to 55 degrees, and they'll go in there with their full bodies and stuff like that. A lot of guys will go back and forth between the hot tub and the cold tub, just trying to flush themselves out a little bit. Hot packs are obviously very popular for guys, warm up their backs and things like that. Um, we have some paraffin wax here, guys that have hands or wrists that are sore, stuff like that, they'll dip their hands in there and use that. Uh, it's kind of kind of like what you see at some salons and stuff, good for skin too, I guess. but. On a game night, typically some of the big things for us are that we do have, we always have an orthopedic surgeon here. We always have a family practice a sports medicine trained physician here. We have a dentist at the games. We have two paramedics that are dedicated to the ice surface. Um, obviously our biggest concern is any kind of a medical emergency, um, something big that could happen out there. If that happens, we're fully prepared. We've gone through all that before the season, trained with all of our doctors and our paramedics and everybody else. In here is where the doctors will do a lot of the suturing. Um, so they'll stitch guys up right back here, patch guys up, take a look at a guy. Uh, if we have to, sometimes we'll send them off for an x-ray or whatever that may be. But for the most part, we try and do everything in-house and just kind of keep everything um, right here. After the game, we got some guys that come in and do maintenance treatment, right? Guys that just have something that's a little bit sore, they'll come in for an ice bag. Typically, they'll go in the weight room, do some work with Marcus, our strength and conditioning coach, after the game, get at least a little flush ride in, roll out, stretch, those kinds of things. Then they'll come in here for a little bit of maintenance treatment, which might be it might involve using some of the machines and some of the different electrical stimulation, stuff like that. For the most part, it's a lot of ice, a lot of stretch, um, and a lot of hands-on work. So there's a lot of you know, soft tissue stuff that goes on in here. I mean, some people call it massage, but we don't, we don't, we don't do massage right. just for fun. We do it for, for rehab and to hopefully make them feel better. But 
Um, for the most part, yeah, guys are guys are in here pretty regularly. I mean, it's definitely it's a busy place. So we got Billy Sir Harvey here, defenseman for the Griffins, second year pro. Um, can you talk about you know what it's been like? Obviously, you went through the OHL. Now you're at the AHL, one step away from the NHL. Can you talk about the process, lifelong dream of getting here, and now you're one step away from the NHL? Yeah, I, I think for me it's been a well. First year was tough, was in and out of the lineup a lot, so you know it's been a lot of growing and and a uh, lot of understanding what it takes to be there. So uh, you know, still. Uh, one step away, so you have to keep working every day, and and uh, like I say, a lot of last year was a lot of learning, and and to see what it takes, and now trying to do all the things right every day. So it's been it's been teaching teaching a lot, and and uh, same time, uh, you know, getting to know a lot of new stuff for me, what I yeah. probably didn't think engineers, but have to take here. What is the biggest difference from the OHL to the AHL? I, I think consistency. Uh, you have to be good every day. You have to show up to practice and and battle for for a spot. So uh, I think that's the that's probably the, been the biggest thing for me to try to stay consistent and be good every day. Talk to us a little bit about the approach you take with the players, like especially at the AHL level, where everybody's that one step away. You're in a fine line of you obviously want to win games, but you have guys coming up and down all the time. What's the approach you like to take with the players as far as not only developing them, but also you're trying to come out here and compete every night? Yeah. Well, again, I've worked for three different organizations under three different philosophies of development. So I think it all depends on, and everyone has to be on the same page from, from the general manager to the assistant general manager to the coaching staff to the player development people. And uh, you know, there are different philosophies that I've come across and different managerial styles uh, here in Detroit in Grand Rapids, uh, the philosophy is develop and win. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's tough to fulfill both, but uh, I know for a fact that they think, you know, winning is a skill and that you obviously develop a lot quicker in a winning environment. And I think the culture here that was established way before I got here of, of having success has made a lot of these kids that are now in Detroit, that are now not kids anymore, uh, have learned how to win, and that's a skill, and they developed uh, quicker in, in a winning environment, and they've turned into long-term Red Wings. I've been with the team since inception, so uh, I started with the team October 95, we dropped the puck October 96, and during that time a lot's happened. Uh, we've won two championships, uh, numerous awards. Uh, we've uh, started off in the IHL. We started off as a as a non-affiliated team uh, in the IHL. Then we had an affiliation with the Ottawa Senators. And really, since we've been in the American League, which is 16, 17 years, we've been affiliated with the Detroit Red Wings. So uh, a lot has changed, but a lot is still the same. You know, obviously the AHL is a stepping stone to the NHL, and you know the NHL is making a lot of decisions for what the players look sure. like here. How does that work, um, you know, on your end as well, you know, making those, making those relationships? Yeah, and that relationship has continued to evolve. So when we started in the American Hockey League, we had what I considered a partial affiliation. So uh, about a dozen players were contracted through Detroit, and then we went out and signed our own players. Uh, a lot of the hockey staff were on our payroll, uh, maybe one or two were on their payroll. And starting with the 2012-2013 season, we changed that affiliation to what I consider an all-in affiliation. So we went to Detroit and said, we're going to give you what you're experts in, which is finding and developing hockey players. We're going to retain what we think we're experts in, which is uh, putting on a great show, selling tickets, selling sponsorships, being a part of the community, etc. So there's a little bit of nervousness associated with, with that because the hockey product, that is our product, that's who we are, and you're to a certain extent giving up control of that product, but Detroit's been remarkable. So 12-13, first year we kind of went into that relationship, 2013, the playoffs, first championship. So the stars aligned perfectly, and really since that time we've been in the playoffs every year. Detroit's done a tremendous job of giving us competitive teams and great character players. Guys that fit into the community, guys that give back, 
guys that are just good people to be around and interact with our fans. So, so I shared uh, with staff a quote at the beginning of the year. Um, it was by the, Joe DiMaggio, the Yankee Clipper, and it talks about you know how he feels like he he owes the fans whether it's your first game, whether it's your last game, whether it's your only game. I owe those fans my best. And the same is true for us. So like for our crew, for our staff, every game's one to 38. For a lot of our fans, it could be one and only. So consequently, we wanna make every game special. And even though it's maybe a Wednesday night early in the year, and it's kinda of like, oh, here we go again. That could be the only game for whatever family, et cetera. And we owe that to them to make a special, fun, entertaining atmosphere, et cetera. And I think for the most part, we have delivered on that. And that's really just about who we are. And, and you know, I think back to our vision and mission statement. We want to create remarkable entertainment for our fans and connect to our community. And that's how we do it every single night. Tell us a little bit about what you do exactly and, and for the Grand Rapids Griffins. And obviously you, you're involved in ticket sales, but what does that entail and what exactly do you do? Sure, well, ticket sales is everything from single game ticket sales to um, group outings, season tickets, uh, you name it, anything that has to do with a ticket, my department's involved in. We get started in the off season, uh, usually in the late spring, early summer, and uh, myself, director, and the director of a ticket and game operations, we get together and we go over like, what do we feel like could get those casual fans excited to come out to a Griffins game? Um, so you know, we brainstorm and whether it's superhero night, whether it's Star Wars night, you know, we think about what would get fans to want to come out, um, what would get them um, excited about hockey. Maybe they don't know who the top goal scorer is or they don't know maybe the, the biggest names on the team. However, they know they're going to have a great time at the game because we have Star Wars characters out or because they're going to get that bobblehead um, that you know, is big on our schedule. So you know, we work together as a team here in the office to think about you know, what could we do to get our fan base excited about coming out. Games. My department is in charge of finding corporate partners that want to uh, uh, partner with the Griffins uh, from a marketing standpoint throughout the season. So there's a lot of aspects to that. There could be some branding opportunities, whether it's dashboards or nice logos. Uh, one of the bigger things right now is obviously tying in with the Griffins with social media uh, for all of our, uh, our all of our portals: uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, even Snapchat. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, ticket sales as well, but the primary reason for corporate sales is to find those partners in West Michigan and throughout the Midwest that uh, uh, feel the Griffins are beneficial from a marketing standpoint. But everything's about customer service and about what the fan wants. So trying to put together promotions that are fun for the fans to participate in and to watch, tie that in with a sponsor that uh, has, a nice, uh, has a nice promotion as part of their game night sponsorship or branding aspect, um, it all ties in pretty nicely. you know. And, and, you, you definitely want people to recognize it and notice it, right. uh, but you don't want it to be so in your face that it's taking taking over the game. Um, you know, the American Hockey League allows us to put so many logos in the ice, dashboards, things like that. Uh, so we find sponsors that are willing to uh, take advantage of those marketing opportunities. So, you know, a lot of press boxes you think of, you know, separate booths and rooms mm -hmm. <clears throat> for all the different uh, people who need to be up there. We're just one big happy family here and <laughs> hopefully you don't have vertigo because right. I think it's the best view in the house, but yeah. there are some people sometimes who get a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> you know, freaked out by how yeah, high we are. There's two things we really do in the PR department here. Uh, our first goal is to spread the Griffin's gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that through uh, you know, everything we do with the media, pitching stories, our publications, our website, all that sort of thing. Even working with our internal departments, video, social media, broadcasting to really get our stories out. Uh, not just what the team's doing on the ice, but all the great stuff we're doing in the community. Um, and then secondly, we want to provide a major league level of service to everybody that we encounter. Uh, and a lot of that happens on a game night right up here in the press box. We usually have about at least a half dozen NHL teams that are represented here on any given night. Uh, I think our record Sometimes on a Wednesday, you wouldn't think scouts might be coming through on a Wednesday, but a lot of times on Wednesdays we'll have up to 15, 16, 17 NHL teams that are represented here. And then especially once you get into the playoffs and uh, you get deeper in the playoffs and there's fewer teams playing, right. then we really uh, we take some overflow area up here in the press box and I really have to squeeze everybody in kind of tight. How are the three stars determined? Three stars of the game, I think. Who picks them? Right? Well, that's that's a very important process, as you know, and it's it's kind of a, a, a secret that we don't like to tell yeah. very often. Um, but uh, we ha we convene a, a group of media. Uh, a lot of times, uh, in all seriousness, if Pete Warner from Grand Rapids Press is here, um, he typically chooses three stars. Uh, he's not here tonight, uh, so 
by tradition, a lot of times that falls to the PR staff then to pick. Um, so, yeah, it's a big responsibility. I don't know. Not anybody can shoulder it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think Rick's, Rick and I are some media. You think we could be the choose the three stars tonight? Do you know anything about the game? I mean, I've watched a couple of tutorial videos. Yeah. Okay. I, I, we can give you a shot. I think we can we'll, swing We'll it. try it out tonight. I think All we right. can swing it. Right. Awesome. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. So everything that the fans see that's going on and all the stuff, these are the guys that do it right here. Let's check it out. Brandon's director of Game Ops, so he's up here calling the show. So he's got the headset on, he's talking to many people out there from Naki with the video board to Josh, the in, in stands guy, etc. So essentially you're like producing the show that's going yeah. on, what yeah. everybody yeah. sees, right? Yes, exactly. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I write all the game scripts, so everything, so all these guys sit up here so right down there handles all the LED boards and our matrix board um, over to center ice right here we have our light controller uh, that handles all the house lights all the FSIS lighting so all the lights configurations he handles right here in a way you almost have a little bit of an influence on the game because you yeah. can pump up the crowd at certain moments I, and get the clapping <laughs> yeah. hands going and get the crowd I, going I, and maybe that yeah, inspires I, the team I'd like to, to say so we, we hear try to provide the experience for the fans you know we always say we can't control what happens on the ice but we can control the experience that they have very uh, cool. throughout whether it's throwing them on the video board or playing a certain uh, crowd prompt or whatever song a sing-along song different right. stuff like that so they can go home with a different memory because like I said we always can't we can't control right. how the game goes but we can control how they how they feel Tonight, it is game two of seven consecutive inside Van Amden Arena as the Griffins, for only the fifth time in franchise history, welcome to town the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Since the 2012 and 13 campaign, the Griffins have won 294 games, the Penguins 292. That is second only to the Toronto Marlies as the most successful AHL teams over the past six and a half seasons. That and the fact that these teams play with such little frequency makes this a very special night. As we're underway, Griffin's cutting in. Here's Pumpo and a shot just missed the net. Here's Sari Arby to Sedina, a shot missed the net. Camper back to Philip Peronic. Backs up in the middle, back to Camper, right circle, now left side, Sedina, right a shot, score! Philip Sedina cuts the needle from in tight to the Griffin with another power play goal. Have one to nothing lead. Veronik in now to Chris Terry, angles right in front. On far side, oh, another great chance in front. That one deflected right into the goal, boy. Rebar just quick behind him, and now we got McGrath again. All over, is that D again? Yeah, you got a net. You got two on one right out in front. Three on one with Matt Ford. So that'll do it for period one. So the Griffins get out with a one nothing lead on the power play goal by Philip Zadina. So obviously we find ways to get to random places in an ice rink, but this has got to be one of the coolest places we've ever sat and watched a game. Pretty good. I think I make a pretty good Pierre Maguire if I do say so. You got Will Spray on your left, the Griffins on your right. How are you feeling out here, Pierre? Oh, I'm feeling real good. I'm I'm not cramped like you see in, in uh, Little Caesars oh, Arena, yeah. but got plenty of room here and we're feeling good tonight. Yeah, the speakers blaring down on yeah. you. The crowd is juiced. Oh, yeah. In the beginning of the second period, they dropped the puck, crossed out of camp, he cuts in right circle, that's a shot, go save, and the rebound. Sebastian D, a fancy little hockey player, that guy. Now they put it right in front and score. Puck rolled to the goal mouth and right there to sweep it in was Sam Militic. And the game is tied at 1 1. do it. Period number two is the Penguins get the only goal in the middle frame and we go to the locker rooms through 40 tied 1-1.
They line it up at center, and away we go with period number three here. The Griffin's now up with it, and they march back three on two. They got Campbell on right wing. Here's the pass. Campbell, knee drop pass. Hickens rolled it right in front. Pike loose. And can attempt score. Colin Campbell rolled it into the empty net. The Griffins are back on top of two to one. Terjean digging in with Ben Sexton on the face off. Shulak will charge out. Suddenly three on two at the line to Terjean. He pulls up, lets it go right on the rebound. Shulak score! Lee Bard Shulak! And the Griffins lead it three to one. Seconds left in the two man advantages. Pumple for the joint score! And the Griffins are blown it open now. They lead it 4 to 1. Big, big decision here. We got to pick the three stars and let Jason Pearson know so they can communicate it. What are we going with? Huge responsibility. I think, obviously, being a goalie guy, I think we got to have the goalie kept it to a one goal yeah, game. Made a lot of really good night. saves. Yeah. I agree. The second star, I would have to say the game winning goal. Who scored it? Campbell. Okay, Campbell, I'd say number two. And then uh, who, who else? Who else well, I, I'm I, gonna let you pick that I, third I one. I think I think Pumple should be the second star. He had a goal and he had the okay. game-winning assist. Okay. And Campbell just had the game-winning goal. So I okay. think Campbell's the third star. Okay. I so who we got? Pumple. Number one. Number one is Rebar. Cool. Three. Number two. Pumple. Cool. Three. Campbell. All right. Let's lock it in. Cool. Let's do it. Pickens will play it down to four seconds remaining, and the Griffins victorious again on home ice. Game-winning goal, number 45, Colin Campbell. Star number two, had a goal and an assist, number 73, Matt Pumple. Number 42, Patrick you know, you're more of the grind guy, you're the, the PKer, and to come up big tonight, how's it feel? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while, but uh, tonight you know, we worked hard and we had some chances, and I uh, was happy to get one get in there. Speak a little bit about the, uh, the play of your goaltender tonight. He came up big with a lot of saves, 33 yeah. save night tonight. He seemed like he was seeing the puck real well through traffic. And Just speak a little bit about the play of your goaltender. Yeah, well, Patrick's a very calm kid. Not a lot gets him rattled. You can see that in his play. Uh, that's how he is off the ice. Sometimes you want to grab him, shake him a little bit to <laughs> get a little bit of life out of him. But uh, I think overall he's just a very you know, calm and collected kid. And he's got a lot of composure. And, uh, he's come in and done a very good job as a rookie here. And again, we're confident in both of our goalies. And at a certain point, you know, one of them's going to step up and take the ball and run with it. That's a wrap, everybody, with the Grand Rapids Griffins. Thank you, Mike, for being my tour guide with this uh, this beautiful facility. And thank you to the Grand Rapids Griffins for allowing us to get some cool shots and everything that we did today. I really appreciate everything you guys did. Yeah, and I want to thank uh, my past co-workers for lending us in and, and uh, allowing us to showcase what you do. I think it's going to be really awesome for the fans. Yeah, cool. Thank you, guys. Tell me up.